Hello everyone, today I'm going to show you how you can control your ESP32 microcontroller from any place in the world with the internet connection in an early real time. To make it possible, I'm going to have to create a three different projects. The first one, Arduino framework project created with Platform.io. This is going to be the code that will run on the microcontroller and perform requested actions, like for example, changing the voltage on a digital pin. Second project will be a React.js application hosted on AWS S3. It will run in the browser. That's where we'll be able to send the commands from using a nice web interface. Third project, AWS API Gateway WebSockets server. This will be a central point of communication and will be responsible for passing WebSocket messages between our clients, React.js web app and ESP32. In terms of hardware, I will use ESP32 dev kit board, LED diode, current limiting resistor, and some wires to connect everything together. As always, you can find all the specification in the description below. And now let's begin from the implementation. So I'm going to open my IDE first. With Visual Studio Code opened, let's start from building platform IO project that's gonna be deployed to ESP32 microcontroller, a WebSocket client app. So I'm gonna start from clicking on platform IO icon, the section over here, then from the quick access menu, open, just gonna close this sidebar, then on new project, name of the project, ESP32 WebSockets, the board, I'm just gonna type node MCU and gonna select node MCU 32S, framework gonna keep Arduino and the default location. Now I'm gonna click on finish and after a few seconds the project should be created. Okay, done. And now before I start writing code, let's think about the main prerequisite for this project, which is the Wi-Fi connection, right? It is actually an internet connection, but to get an internet connection, we need to connect to Wi-Fi first. And because this part has been already covered in another video, ESP32 Wi-Fi Connect, I'm going to go to my GitHub and just copy paste the project configuration from there. Um, essentially just this line, which is a monitor speed. This is for the serial communication. And then I'm gonna go to SRC and main.cpp. I am going to go for the blocking method and that blocking method of connecting to Wi-Fi is basically that the program is not going to continue until the Wi-Fi connection is established. If you are interested in more details how this code works, I really recommend watching ESP Wi-Fi Connect uh, video. You can find link in the description. And by the way, don't forget to replace these two values with your actual home Wi-Fi network name and password. Otherwise, the board won't be able to connect to the internet. Okay, so now let's add uh, the WebSocket client code, which is gonna go right in there after the println connected. So that point, we should definitely uh, be connected to Wi-Fi. The board should be connected to Wi-Fi. Okay, so for the WebSocket client, we need to install an external library and I'm gonna do it with the with the help of platform IO again. So I'm gonna go to, so yeah, either you can go back to this icon and uh, click on open or just click on the tab over there if you had the tab as I had. And then two libraries and then search libraries in the search libraries, uh, in the search box, we want to type WebSockets. Then that should be like third or fourth result. Yes, which is this WebSocket library. We want to click on it and add it to the project. 
obviously uh, we need to select the project, the one that we are working in. In my case, this is ESP32 WebSockets. And then click on Add. Okay, great. Yeah, we can close PIO home for now and platform io.ini, we're not gonna need it. And now, first of all, I'm gonna have to include this library, which is WebSocket, WebSockets client. And I need to create an instance of it, right? So I need to call it constructor. So what I'm gonna type in is WebSockets client, and let's just call it maybe WS client. That should be enough. Okay, the next step right in here after the, the print LN connected, I'm going to type WS client dot begin SSL. So we're gonna establish a secure connection with the WebSocket server. The reason is that AWS API Gateway WebSockets gives us a secure URL when once we create the server. So we're gonna have to establish a secure connection, okay? So for that, what we need is a host. And at this point, I don't know yet what that host is going to be. I don't know, actually I do know the port, but let's use a another constant. I'm just using constants that I'm gonna define at the beginning in a second. For the URL, yeah, we're gonna find out once we have our server, okay? So let's just call it WS URL. Um, the fingerprint, for now, I'm just going to skip it, so I will leave it empty. And the protocol, that's gonna be WSS, okay? Okay, good. Yeah, let me just copy these values now and define them as constants. They will be empty WS host and URL. And the port will be 443 because that's the default port for WSS protocol. Good, okay. So that establishes the connection. There is one more line of code that needs to be added in the loop which is WS client dot, uh, I think it's called loop. Yeah, that's the loop method. So that's gonna keep the connection alive. And we also need to set, if you want to be able to receive any events from this WebSocket uh, server, right? Through this WebSocket client, we need to call on event method and provide an event handler that I will have to create as a function. So let's define a function on WS event maybe. Then what kind of signature this function should have? Maybe let's copy this name of that function and pass it to on event. And then let's click through on on event. We've got WebSocket client event. Let's just click through on it. Okay, so yeah, that's the signature that we need to copy paste. They should be right in there. Okay, so what we've got is a type. That's the type of an event that get triggered at any point in time, I guess. Then we have a payload and the length of that uh, payload. Payload basically is any information from the event, okay? So there's like a payload of the event. Okay, let's handle that event with switch case. So we will have WS type I think what we've got, um, yeah, maybe let's click through and see what type of, okay, that's an enum. So I'm just going to copy all of these values and let's just 
handle some of them because we don't need to handle all of them essentially yeah we are interested in disconnected connected text and maybe an error which i'm going to skip for now because i think it might not be even needed i guess unless you want to add some debugging troubleshooting code yeah okay so um maybe let's move connected to to be the first one cool okay um yeah we're probably gonna get some we're gonna get them warning uh because we're not handling other types but should be fine right so when the the, the client connects to the server this event is going to be uh, triggered right so what we're gonna see is just an information in the in the serial monitor let's just do something like that and just break uh, then when we disconnect i mean when the board disconnects from the server say it's because the internet connection dropped we're gonna get an information and finally, the last one, which is the most important, this is when the client receives a message from the server, okay? And when it receives the message from the server, this is going to be the way of controlling ESP32 in a real time, okay? So we, we're going to have the other client sending a message to the server and then a server passing this a message to the other clients. Let's do serial printf. This is going to be useful for the debugging purposes. Let's just call it WS message. And then let's just display the payload. Okay, and break at the end. One more step though, which is going to be I guess let's create another separate function. This is where we're going to handle that uh, payload. Because when we receive the message, we want to read that message and based on the information that is in the message, microcontroller is going to perform an action, okay? Which is gonna be either uh, a read kind of action or write kind of action. So write, uh, read just gonna give back some information back to the server and then this is going to be distributed to the other clients or write is going to actually do something okay so maybe switch on the diode but also i guess it would be nice to just send back some sort of acknowledgement message or like a, a, a return status that you know that operation has succeeded so um yeah i think i think this is a, a right time to um, create another method another function which is going to be handle message Let's just call it handle message and there we're just gonna take this payload which is gonna be essentially passed to handle message okay so payload so we will have a different responsibilities here so this is just a listener and this is just gonna this this function is going to be responsible for passing the message and now how are we gonna pass this message so because on the other side there's gonna be react.js application the sort of standard way of uh, communicating in web applications right nowadays is json we can we can say it is json so i think a good format that we can use here uh, could be json and for json we're gonna need to install another external library it's called arduino json so let me just add it to the project again what we have to do is to click on platform io icon then quick access open libraries and in here let's just type json and that's going to be the first one that i'm going to add to project select the project i'm in and click on add 
And now I don't want to close it yet because there is an example that is very useful. So if you click here on that select box and you type parse and then you click on JSON parser example, this is really nice example of how to parse JSON, right? Because that's, go that's gonna be the format we expect to get. Okay, so in the handle message function, the payload is going to be a message, but in a different format, which is, which is okay because we can parse it with Arduino JSON. So let's just copy a few fragments of code. First of all, let's copy this fragment of code, which is the include. Just gonna place it on the top of our main.cpp file. And then let's copy this bit, which is static JSON document creation. And that's gonna that's gonna be in the handle message. It's gonna be initiated there. And then finally, this fragment starting from deserialization error up to there. So this whole if statement. Okay, now I, I can close PIO home. And then this is actually what we need. One small modification, actually two small modifications. The first one is let's use a payload because that needs to be passed to deserialize JSON. This, this function basically parse our JSON and turns it into a document, which we can use then to read some uh, data, uh, fields from JSON document. And then the static JSON document, this second small modification is on the size, the fixed size. Let's define something like JSON doc size, and let's set it to 2048. Should be, yeah, more than enough. Cool, okay. So yeah, let me explain what this code does. So what we do, um, we essentially create a static JSON document here. Then this, uh, the reference to that document is passed to deserialize JSON uh, along with the payload. And then the error is the output of this deserialize JSON function. If the error is there, so there was an error, this is like either incorrect JSON or the format of JSON is somehow wrong. This, uh, this error check is going to um, be true basically. And then the, the information about the error is printed out in the serial monitor. One additional step that we can do is to send an error information back to the server that again is gonna be passed to the client. So whoever send the incorrect message to our microcontroller is going to get back a message with the error, right? This is a good thing to have, right? That two way sort of communication. There's gonna be a request and a response. How to send an information, how to send a message back to the server? There is just one method that we need to call and that method is send txt where we're gonna where we're gonna have to just pass a payload which can be string const char or uh uint yeah we have like yeah few overloads of this uh, method what i'm gonna do is to create a separate function to send that error message where I take a const char error and in there we're going to define a char array. Let's just call it message and let's uh, define another size for it. So let's maybe call it message size. Let's give it 128. And that message size is going to be the size of the of the message char array. 
Then with sprint f, we're going to prepare first a JSON message, the action. So action, it's good to have an action field because that's, that's the default format of a JSON that we sent to API Gateway WebSockets. So if you define a custom route in there, then you pass that route as an action in a JSON message. And that's why I'm just gonna go for it. Otherwise we would have to handle it sort of differently. And for that action, let's just call it MSG. As for the message, And then I guess um, let's just continue with a message, which is gonna be another object. And that object is going to have status. Error. But yeah, really here you can you can go with whatever format you like. I'm just gonna go with this one. So I will have so always action and then the body of that action. Maybe I rename it to body, but one second. So your status is error and the actual error is going to be that one that's passed to the send error message function, okay? So let's just do that. And you know what, maybe let's just change this to body. Okay, nice. Um, this is quite big. Okay, yeah, that should be fine. 128. Yeah, in case error is longer, maybe let's double the size. Yeah, and then we, what we want to do is to just send that message back. Okay. So now having this function, this helper send error message function, I can just send that error C string back to the to the WebSocket server. Okay, cool. So now we can start reading some information from that JSON that we have passed with deserialized JSON. And, and for that, let's think about another format of a message that ESP32 is going to be um, basically supposed to receive from another client. So something very similar to the error message, but this message, instead of like having an error, should have uh, some information about the command that needs to be executed on the microcontroller. So, um, and yeah, by the way, I'm just thinking maybe instead of status, we just call this type. So we'll have a body and there's gonna be type and and error. Maybe that is better. Yeah, I, I will think about it. I will think about it because we want to simplify this as much as possible. Maybe this is not the best one. Maybe we could have an action MSG then type and then body. I guess, yeah, maybe that would be better. Because I, I started thinking about the, the other type of message that we want to receive this time. That, that's the, not the type that we're sending. And you know what? I think it will be better if this is not nested. So we'll have action MSG, type is error, and the body is the actual error here. So that's gonna stay flat. And the same type of message, the same format will be something that we accept, uh, that we expect to, to get in, in, in here in handle message if the, the JSON uh, is gonna get uh, passed successfully without an error. Um, but yeah, obviously there's gonna be a different type. So you know what? Let's just do another if statement to make sure that there is a type uh, field, let's just make it required. So on the dock, what we're gonna do is to call is 
method that checks if that member of a JSON that we received has a C string type. Okay, so it has to be string on a JSON, basically, the, the JSON string. And, and if it's not, let's just send some error message. Like invalid MSG type. Maybe message type. And then return. Okay, so that's something we have checked. Now the second if let's do if doc type. And here we're going to treat it as a C string. So I'm going to do a string compare. And I'm going to compare it with the CMD. Let's call it CMD as for the command. And if it's identical to command, I mean, if it's CMD, it, there is no, uh, it's not case sensitive, I think, if you do. Uh, str uh, cmp but that's fine if it's a cmd that means we're going to send uh, we're going to call some sort of command on the microcontroller okay and in that case we're going to check for the for the body so we may actually we might actually have another uh, level so then let's just do Let's treat the body. Maybe let's check the body if it's there. This is also good to have a validation like that. So we're going to do doc, body, and again, is, but this time we want to check if this is a JSON object. And if it's not a JSON object, then let's send a message. invalid command body okay right so at this point we know that the body is another nested object and what we can do is to continue checking for what is in there okay and what is in there? Uh, we need to know what type of, of command is this. So it'd be nice to have another type in there. So let's just do if body and command, uh, sorry, and then, and then maybe type is, yeah, I keep forgetting this is not just a simple comparison if you do it in C style. So what we want to do is to compare this with the first type of command that I'm thinking about handling, which is going to be the pin mode. Okay, yeah, let me tell you about my plan here. We want to keep it simple. We only have a diode with a resistor that we're going to connect to ESP32 dev kit today. So I'm going to handle three different functions, pin mode, digital write, and digital read. So we will have a write changing the state of something on the, on the, that is wired up to the microcontroller, or it can be the built-in LED if you want, or reading the state of the pin. So there's also going to be that bit where uh, the message is received by ESP32, the information is read, is red and then it's sent back okay but we're gonna start from from pin mode so this is a write operation so for pin mode uh, what else we're gonna have is the pin this is basically required right because if we call pin mode what we have required is the pin itself so let's do dog body and pin okay we don't need to cast it to int or anything because that's going to be automatic. Although it is a good practice to have validation on these fields as well. Um, I don't want to add them because that's going to take too much time. I will just make sure 
that when we produce the messages, they're going to be in a correct format. But again, I encourage to have guards against anything, especially if it's the ex data coming from the external source. But yeah, I'm going to skip it for now here for the video to not be too long. OK, so the pin and then the actual mode which can be one of the three as far as I remember this can, this can be input input pull up and output let's just handle it by um, maybe let's take a string this might be a good idea because I think these are just three numbers or something to make it nicer to uh, what is actually the second parameter called in there in the pin mode? Oh. I need to remove that. Let's see. So if we do that is mode, okay? So two two mode, which is by the way unsigned int. Eight, and we're gonna accept const char const char pointer and what's gonna happen here is just another comparison really so let's just uh, steal some code from here And this is just gonna be not the type, doc type, but value that we compare with the. Let's just use output. I don't know what's the default one, but let's use output. And for output, we're just going to return that output constant. And then we will have an input pull up and input is going to be the default one since I'm not handling the errors you know not that I'm not that thorough because um, time is limited unfortunately but yeah there should be some validation here If you want to be exact with this, otherwise, yeah, there is sort of a fallback me mechanism, right? So that's going to be two mode. And because this takes const char, we can also just provide document with the mode. Let's just call it mode. So we'll have pin and mode. Okay. Yeah. So that is uh, the pin mode. Obviously, I need to not forget about the return. And two more. So, uh, two more. Let's just copy paste twice. And let's just change pin mode to digital. Write. And digital. Read. For the digital write, this is a very similar situation. However, instead of mode, let's call it value. And basically, this has to be digital write. And we don't need to do that, right? Basically, the second the second argument to digital write is uh, is integer as well, but it's really zero or one that is accepted. Then for digital read, this is slightly different situation. This is what I was talking about. This is where we're going to have a difference because digital read should return a value, right? It should send a message back with that value that's been read from the pin, which is going to be one or zero. But yeah. Let's then use the approach from send error message, but this is a different format of message, right? So let's just do maybe something like that. 
but with a different a type of message which is gonna be let's call it type so instead of error it's not gonna be command right it's more like an output maybe let's call it output and let's just say the body is just gonna be that value but because it's an int it's not gonna be wrapped in the double quotes and then we just send it back okay so we'll have action message type output and that's gonna be the body from the digital read obviously written at the end okay so we have these three types of operations covered some error handling sort of validation some more validation could be added but yeah, I guess I will do it off the camera and uh, include it uh, in the example, in the code example, when I pu publish the video. And we can add one extra step, which is, let's just add here an error. And let's just call it invalid command type. And another one at the very end, which is which is the one, okay, so there is invalid message type, invalid message type. I think it's the same as as this one. Really. Maybe let's call it message type format. And here we can actually say unsupported message type. Unsupported message type. Here also we can have like an unsupported command type instead of invalid because that's not invalid type. It's just something that is not supported by the board. Maybe it's going to be in the future. Cool. Okay. So I think this is pretty much it in terms of ESP32 code or actually yeah there is still one thing uh, missing in in here and that's something I mentioned before which is the acknowledgement message for pin mode and digital write it would be nice to still send some message back just saying something that the status is okay that the device um, just, you know, received the message and uh, done the action that was that was told to do. And uh, for that, I think I'm thinking about just defining. Yeah, let's maybe maybe let's just define another helper function. Based on send error message, but this time send. OK message. Let's call it send OK message. And this will be simpler. Let's just let's just send the hard coded C string as a body OK and type status. Let's just do something like that. And that send OK message is going to be called in two places, which is pin mode just before the return and with digital write. So just as an acknowledgement. OK, and I think uh, now this is it. Of course, we have still two pieces of information missing, which is the WS host and WS URL. But as soon as we obtain this data, I am going to uh, add them. Okay, so yeah, now the second step is the WebSocket server. And for that, we need to create a serverless project. And to create this project, uh, let's have a look at the template 
I've got on my GitHub serverless AWS Node.js TypeScript v2. It's a new template for, for TypeScript serverless projects that can be used with a version 3 of AWS SDK. Basically, there is no dependency, AWS SDK dependency uh, here anymore because that dependency was version 2. Version 3 is modular, so you only install the clients that you need to use, like DynamoDB or API Gateway Management API that we're going to use. Anyway, let's just go to usage and let's copy this command. And now let's go back to Visual Studio Code and let's open a terminal. Actually, I'm just gonna use my own system terminal because I have my projects, web development projects in a projects directory. And in there, I'm just gonna paste that serverless create command, but let's call the project WebSocket Server API GW. Enter. That should create a folder for me with this name that I can go to now. API GW and I can just run code and dot which should open Visual Studio Code this project in Visual Studio Code. Okay, perfect. So yeah, the project is created. And now, and now where we're gonna start from is a serverless.yaml where we define the infrastructure configuration. And this configuration I have already prepared. So let me just paste it in. Okay. It's not much in there. Let me start explaining it from the resources. So there is one resource defined that I called clients table, which is going to contain all of the clients connected to the WebSocket server. There is going to be only one field on, on these documents, which is a connection ID. And that's, that's the only thing that we really need, uh, which is going to be required to be able to send the message from the server to the client. It is a bit tricky with AWS. You need to use a special API, API Gateway Management API, and that API requires connection ID to send a message. Right, so if you want to send a message, let's say server receives a message from web application client to send, let's say, a command to do a pin mode on ESP32. Upon receiving that message, it needs to get a connection ID somehow of the other client and send a message there using API Gateway Management API. And because everything is serverless, there is not really any place that keeps the, the state of all of the connections, doesn't keep it. And that's why we need to have a persistent storage, DynamoDB, to store these connections. Whenever a client connects, we're going to just add the new client to this table with the connection ID. Whenever client, client disconnects, we're going to remove it. And when we send the message from one client to another client, then what the server is going to do is to scan for all of these clients for connection IDs, and it's going to send a message to all other clients, right? So all the clients except for the client that sent the message, right? The sender of the message. But yeah, I'm going to show you once I write the code this is going to be very simple to do, especially comparing to the previous uh, app that I've built, the web chat. 
it was way more complicated than what this is gonna be. Because here, yeah, we, this is just one client's table with one field. Then the role statements for that client's table for put item, delete item, and scan operations. Basically, for these three functions, um, this one should be actually MSG, not send message. So one handler really, three different events, connect, disconnect, MSG, with access to, to that resource client table on these three operations, and two environment variables. We have client table name, which is used in there. That's the actual name of the table that's gonna be created on AWS. And we've got a WSS API Gateway endpoint. This is required by API Gateway Management API to send these messages from the server to the client, something I've just I just explained a couple minutes ago. Okay, um there is one more thing that you may have noticed, which is this uh, prefix in here, self-provider stage. I introduced a stage a field to the provider with a default value as dev. So this is simply adding a prefix to the name of the, of the table so you can have more environments, not just dev. However, we're just gonna work on dev. Okay, um, let's have a look at the handlers file because this is probably just the hello handler that we have to rename to match this name. So that should be handler. That should be handle. And also we don't have our dependencies installed. So let's open a new terminal and let's run yarn. Okay, dependencies installed. I'm going to add two more, but for now, let's just start the implementation. Okay, so first of all, the body is always gonna be an empty string. And what we need to do as two first steps is to extract connection ID from the event that is gonna be on the request context. And we need to make sure this is a string, not string or null. And the same thing we have to do for route key. So this is almost the same like that, but route key. And there is one more const, const var body. Uh, which is essentially event body or an empty string. Then switch case for the route key that can have one of the three values. The values that we defined in the functions, which is connect, disconnect, and MSG. So let's handle them connect, disconnect, and this is gonna be MSG, the custom type. Okay. Depending on what route key is, we're going to return a result of three different functions. Handle connect is the first one, which is gonna be asynchronous function, that takes connection ID, connection ID as a string, and it returns a promise of API gateway proxy result. Then we will have a disconnect, and finally, MSG. They all gonna need connection ID. However, for the MSG, I'm gonna be more explicit. Let's call it this connection ID. I'm going to explain when I'll implement, when I'll be implementing this, this, this function. 
Cool. Um, for handle connect, this is the moment where we need to install the DynamoDB client. So I'm gonna run yarn add AWS SDK DynamoDB client DynamoDB. Okay, DynamoDB added to the packages JSON and installed. Let's create an instance Dynamo of DynamoDB client. New Dynamo. Okay, we're gonna need to import it from DynamoDB. And that is DynamoDB client. where we can just pass an empty config because that's all going to be figured out automatically what sort of region is this uh, based on the environment uh, variables uh, passed automatically by serverless uh, framework, the way that serverless framework configures this whole thing. Okay, so with DynamoDB client now, for handle connect, what I am going to do is to call DynamoDB client sent new put item command where I'm going to pass a table name which is client's table name that we can extract from the environment variable which is this environment variable client's table name or empty clients table is the table name and the item this is where we have a difference comparing with with uh, SDK uh, version 2 of AWS because here we still have to provide the key which has to match the partition key that we have defined in, in serverless.yaml in the resources, connection ID, right? But for the value of that key, there has to be an object with this additional kind of key specifying the type, where S is a string type. And this is where I can pass the connection ID. So what this is gonna do is to create a new document in DynamoDB table clients with connection ID only and the connection ID of the client that has just connected to the WebSocket server. And then right after that, I can return status code 200 and body empty, which is a message OK. And I'm going to extract it to a separate, to a separate const var in a second once I handle the disconnect. For now, let's just call handle connect with the connection ID. Okay, and now disconnect. So for the disconnect, this is gonna be very similar to what I have in the handle connect, but I think now it's the time to extract it to to response. Okay, const var that I'm just gonna response okay i'm just going to create it there the top okay and now let's just copy paste this fragment to the disconnect and let's change that to delete item command and let's change item to key and this is pretty much it to disconnect you just need to send the delete item command with the key where the, the pattern is exactly the same. You need to provide partition key and then the type of that, of that field, which is a string and the actual value that comes from the argument connection ID in here, right? 
The difference really is if we had uh, more fields on that item, on the document, on the client, we would have to specify uh, all of them in the item, right? All of the required ones, if we had specified null ones, we wouldn't have to, but uh, for others, uh, probably yes. Um, otherwise, we would have uh, got an error, an exception. Okay, so handle disconnect is done. I'm going to return it, handle disconnect, also with connection ID. Okay, so basically, whenever connected client disconnects, we want to remove that entry from DynamoDB table, right? That connection ID. Right, the final handler, which is the handle MSG. And here, apart from the connection ID, we're gonna need body, right? This is where we want to pass the message from one client to the others. So let's just, uh, maybe let's just do it first. So handle MSG with connection ID and body. And then what we're gonna do is another operation on DynamoDB client. This time is a scan command. Scan command only needs a table name, but it returns, I mean, all of them uh, return output, also this command and this command, but for the, for the scan command, it is actually relevant because if the output count and output count is greater than zero, we want to do something. Otherwise, we are okay with returning response okay. I guess we could create a warning uh, message that's also an option and send it back to to the to the sender and i'm just thinking this might be a good idea but yeah let's let's leave it for now because for that i would have to use api management api gateway management api yeah maybe we we will do it but for now let's just handle all the other clients except for the for the senders or the the recipients of that message. And uh, what we want to do is to iterate over the items. Yeah, this can be null, so let's just make sure there is always something to iterate on, even if it's nothing, empty array. And then on item, this is where we go into use the API, API Gateway Management API, but let's create another function, send message, so this, will, this function will be responsible for the actual, for, for sending the message, this is just to do the handle to iterate over, to do the scan basically and iterate over the items, then call send message. Yeah, there is one important thing to be done in here, which is another if statement that is going to compare the item, which is, okay, that is the record of string to attribute value. So we will have connection ID on the item dot s so basically now it's other way around, the way we access the values of the field in DynamoDB, because that's the, basically that's the data structure, right? So I'm just following this. We have item connection ID dot S, and if they are different than this connection ID, then the sender connection ID, right? That's the sender connection ID, and all of the items are potential recipients, we want to make sure the recipient is not the sender, right? We, we don't want to 
we don't we don't want for the recipient for the sender to send the message to to themselves right okay um and this is where await send message is going to be called with uh, two parameters connection id this is not this connection id anymore that's going to be this that's going to be the recipient connection id right the recipient connection ID and body is going to stay the same. Now this might be, okay, this might be undefined. So let's just do that. I mean, this, this is not really going to be undefined with our current configuration. Okay, and send a message. Let's install API Gateway management api so yarn add and that's going to be client api gateway management api dependency added let's create an instance of it so i am going to import it from yeah that's gonna be this and that is gonna be api gateway management api and we need to create a client so let's call it api gateway management api api gateway management api and this is important because this is where we want to pass the endpoint, which is a, in an environment variable, right? This environment variable, WSS API gateway endpoint, which is essentially the, the API gateway that is going to be created, but because this is API gateway WebSockets, the endpoint we're going to get has a WSS protocol. And uh, the one that is needed by API Gateway Management API is a HTTP, HTTPS protocol. That's why this environment variable has to be created separately based on the ref values of WebSockets API and region with execute API a subdomain. So that's 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 basically how it works with with API Gateway WebSockets. This is essentially from the, the from the documentation. Okay, and now we want to call post to connection where there are two fields. In the, in the config object that we need to pass, which is connection ID, something that we have, and the body, and the data essentially, which is the body, but the data has a different data type that is required, which is an unsigned int 8 array. It's a bit unusual for JavaScript, but um, yeah, this is required. So what we, what, we, what we can do is to use a built-in text encoder util class encoder text encoder that can encode a string type of a body into into unsigned int array Okay, so that is the send message. One edge case though that is good to handle is the gone exception. The gone exception happens when you try to, to post to the connection that doesn't really exist, but for some reason it hasn't been removed from DynamoDB, right? So let's say we have a connection ID of a client that just disconnected, or for some reason the connection of that client dropped, but the disconnect hasn't been called yet 
or hasn't been called at all. And we, we're trying to post a message to that connection, but it doesn't exist. And this is when post to connection method throws an exception. And that exception is a gone exception. And what we want to do if we get gone exception is to handle that scenario as a disconnect. And that's just it. Uh, let's await for it though. To make sure that connection ID gets deleted and we don't want to treat it as an actual error. If it's something else, then we can still throw an error. That's gonna be basically propagated to the top, which is in the handle function. And then this is just gonna be locked to CloudWatch in the end because we don't really catch it anywhere. For the sake of simplicity, of course. Okay, so um, this, is, this is how the handlers are gonna look like. Um, there is one more thing I was thinking about for maybe sending back a warning message. So I am not 100% sure if this is how this is if this is how to send the warning message back. But I think if I just stringify a JSON here as for the body when I send the that bug, okay, that's not how it's gonna work. So I still need to await and send a message when this is a different case. So if this is not, yeah, I guess we want to respond, okay. Regardless of what happens, but here we want to send a message back to this connection ID with the information that the, the, the sending of the message failed. There was no one to send the message to. So let's just maybe follow this format. Okay from the main.cpp, from our ESP32 code. And let's just pass that instead. I mean, not instead, just pass that as the actual message. So that would be a message type. We can just call it warning and the body could be no recip recipient. Maybe that's just to make it simple. Okay. So that's what we're gonna do. Let me just quickly go through the code again. So a handle a function, this is where it all starts, right? This is this is what's gonna be triggered whenever connect, disconnect, or MSG happens. And what we do first, we extract connection ID, route key, and body. Depending on the route key, we're doing one of uh, these uh, three different, we call one of these three different handlers. If the client connects to the WebSocket server, handle connect, connect is executed, and we create a new client in DynamoDB with the connection ID, and that's it. If the route key is disconnect, client is just disconnecting from the server, what we're doing is to remove that client from a DynamoDB table. And finally, when MSG is received as a, as a route key, then we handle that by doing a scan command on DynamoDB table to get all of the clients from the clients table, then making sure that there are clients in the results, right? The count of the of the items uh, th that that are in the output from Dynamo uh, from the scan command are greater than than zero. And if this is the case, what happens is 
we iterate over all of the items and we send uh, that message, we pass that message to all of the recipients, all of the other clients. But essentially, there's just going to be one client in case of sending a message from web application to ESP32. And then the case for having no recipients. So let's say ESP32 is switched off and we send the message from the web application. Then what we're going to get back is just a warning that the recipient is not there, right? ESP32 is offline. But yeah, basically this, this could be applied to like multiple ESP32s. You could essentially with this, you could control all of them, but they will all get the same command, right? So, it, so this code needs some modification if you would like to control uh, more ESP32s independently. Okay, and yeah, for the send message itself, the piece of code that posts to connection, we just handle one edge case for the gone exception when the client is no longer connected, but we still try to connect, we still try to send a message to that to that client. Sorry, we, tr we still try to send that. And then we basically disconnect, remove that client from DynamoDB. Cool, okay. So um, and now let's just deploy this code. We can do it by going to terminal and then calling either serverless deploy or we can even do something like yarn deploy. Okay, the code deployed. And now what we have in the output is the URL to newly created API Gateway WebSocket server. And what we want to do now is to copy that value and to go back to our ESP32 WebSockets project. And then let's paste it to WS uh, host. However, this part needs to go to WS URL and the protocol can be removed because that's been already passed in the begin SSL. Okay, so um, and now what we can do is to deploy that code to ESP32. In order to do that, let's make sure ESP32 is connected to the computer using USB cable. And if it is, let's just click on the upload button. When you see connecting message on the screen with the dots, it's time to press on the boot button on the development board and hold it until you see writing, then you can release it. Okay, the code deployed. Let's connect to the serial monitor now by clicking on this button. And in a few seconds, we should see some serial communication from the board. Okay, we can see connected and WS connected. That means ESP32 managed to connect to our WebSocket uh, server. Okay, and now what is left to build is the third and final project. And that is a React.js application, our user interface, right? The place from where we'll be able to send the commands to ESP32 microcontroller. To create uh, that uh, project, I'm going to use another template that I created beforehand. And that is a Vite React TypeScript Tailwind CSS template. With that template, you don't need to do any configuration uh, to have TypeScript and Tailwind CSS with an example uh, app, which is like a create React app, really. So we're going to completely change it to our control panel, right? That's what I'm going to be building. Um, to use the template, the only thing that needs to be done is uh, git clone, right? So we need to clone this repository. I'm just going to copy this. And then I'm going to open my terminal. Then change directory to the projects directory and run git clone, paste what I've just copied, and I'm going to clone it into a specific directory, which is ESP32 control panel. 
Okay, and now I'm gonna change directory to this newly created ESP32 control panel project. And I'm gonna open that project with Visual Studio Code by typing code space and dot. Right, okay, so I've got Visual Studio Code opened with ESP32 control panel. That's the React.js application template. What I'm gonna do first is to install all the dependencies. So I just open a terminal in Visual Studio Code and I'm gonna run yarn, just yarn, that's it. Okay, done. And now we can run yarn dev to start the application. This is just an example application, but I'm gonna show you how it looks like. So if you create an app with it, that's what you're gonna see. That means it is working. Okay, I'm gonna split that the browser window and I'm gonna put it on the side. So let's just let's just do this. So we will see all of the changes I'm making. Okay, nice. Um, before I modify this code, I have to install an external dependency to connect to the WebSocket server to simplify that connection. So I've just added a new terminal tab and I'm gonna run yarn add react use websocket which is gonna be a custom hook to connect to the websocket uh, server okay so that dependency installed and now i can go to src app.tsx and in there we want to first remove that example code maybe i leave the main container and then let me remove this React logo. Okay, uh, let's import this custom hook to connect to the WebSocket server. So that's gonna be use WebSocket from React used WebSocket. And let's call this a function use WebSocket. It requires a full URL to the WebSocket server. So I'm gonna go to our ESP32 WebSockets project and I'm gonna just copy this host. Then type the protocol, host and the path. Because yeah, as I said, it requires full URL. Then uh, what you can do now, because use WebSocket uh, returns an object, we can destructure this object into const vars. And we only need three of them uh, from, from that use WebSocket uh, custom hook. Uh, we need last message, that's gonna keep the last message received from the server. We need send message, this is a function to send a message to the server. And a ready state, this is the current state of the connection. Okay, I'm gonna use those uh, later. For now, I'm gonna start building this uh, UI, this user interface. So let's add a heading, ESP32 control panel maybe. And now we need two elements. One element to switch the state of the pin, okay? Something like a toggle where I can switch on or off a digital pin, change its state to high or low. And other than that, I'm thinking about uh, some sort of a drop down where I can pick the pin that I want to control, right? That's one way of doing it. You can also have like multiple toggles for every single pin, but this is like less flexible. So yeah, um, how this is gonna look like, uh, let me just show you. I've got this nice website with tailwind CSS uh, components. Um, that's gonna be the one for toggle but the bigger one, there is a separate example, large toggle. So with that, we'll be able to control the pin. And if we connect LED diode to that pin, we'll be able to control that diode. So yeah, maybe let's copy this example. So that's the last one from here. And let's create a div container and paste it inside that div container. We need to do small modifications though, because this is just a pure HTML, CSS 
I mean pure HTML example. So we need class name instead of class attribute because we are using React and that has to be closed, that input. Okay. Yeah, let's see how it looks like. Nice. Okay, so yeah, we've got the toggle. This is how you switch on, switch off uh, LED diode if it's connected to digital pin. Now, to pick the pin to select it, I'm going to use another component. And that component is a simple select. So let's just go for the first example from here. And again, let's maybe add a diff and add that example in there. Also, some modifications need to be done, like class name. ID is not really required in there. And I'm going to change the options in a second, but let's have a look how it looks like. Okay, so we've got the select an option. Uh, you know what? Maybe let's call it, uh, maybe let's do select a pin. Make the text bigger. And the options are not going to be countries, right? This is going to be the digital pin. Yeah, let's think about these pins now to render options of that select box correctly. So maybe I'm gonna create a const var output pins and let's let's just pick few random pins. 18, 19, 22 and 23. I think these are actual pins on my ESP32 dev kit. And this is just a, a number array. Let's go to the select and let's use a map on this array to display all of these options. Okay, option. The value of the option, it's always going to be the same as the, the pin value. Uh, I mean, not the pin value, actually the pin sort of ID. And what we're going to display is GPIO and the pin. Much better. Okay. So now you can see you have GPIO 18, 19, 22, 23. For the large toggle, I don't really want this to be a large toggle uh, label in there. Maybe let's do off and on. For now, let's do off because that's switched off. That's going to change dynamically. When you switch it on, that should change to on. But that needs that, that needs a behavior in this React component to make it happen, which I'm going to add in a second. But what I don't like is that there is no separation between select and toggle. So let's add maybe a margin. Maybe something like that. OK, nice. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, and now let's implement the behavior of this uh, drop down and toggle for now without sending or handling, uh, receiving any messages from the WebSocket server. So just pure React behavior for the select and for the toggle. There are going to be two separate uh, states. The first state, I'm going to call it a selected pin, set selected pin, use state, and that's going to be uh, output pin. The first output pin is going to be default one as it is right now, GPO, uh, GPIO 18. Then the second state to handle the toggle is going to be pin value, right? For which I'm going to use a boolean. So this is going to be false as a default, as it is right now. OK, um, let's add attributes to the select, the value attribute that is going to be selected pin and on change, which is going to change the selected pin to 
data, it's gonna be e target value. It's gonna set a new value, right? When uh, when we change that, when we select another pin. But yeah, obviously we have to use the parse int. Uh, I think that is correct. Not like that. That is correct. Yeah. So parse int to change the value, which is a string, to int to number, because that's the data type of a selected uh, pin. Now the pin value. So for the pin value, this is gonna be very similar. Although instead of actual value, I'm gonna use a checked attribute, which is gonna be our pin value. And then on change doesn't need to capture any event because what we can what we can do is to just invert, right? Just invert the pin value. So if it's true, it's gonna be false. If it's false, it's gonna be true. So that's gonna be our new value. Okay. Okay, nice. So now here, nothing's really gonna change with this behavior, but internally we have two new states now and they change whenever we change anything in there. And you know what? Thanks to that, I can fix that off on so depending on the pin value, I can have on or off displayed in there. So when I switch it on, we've got on. When I switch off, we've got off. This is, uh, this is nice. Now, um, time to send a message to ESP32 microcontroller. We've sent message function from use a WebSocket uh, hook. This is pretty straightforward. The only thing we need to do is first to identify where we want to send the message, what's gonna trigger that action. And then this is, this is simple, right? This is gonna trigger that action. So whenever these changes, right? Whenever a toggle is toggled, we want to send a new message and that message has to be a string type, but because we use JSON, JSON strings, basically, I'm gonna use a JSON stringify to send a string, but still operate on an object. So one second, let me just add action, right? If you remember MSG, this is used to pass the message, right? For, for the server to pass the message to another client. So action MSG type is gonna be CMD, right? This is a command and body has type again. This is gonna be digital write pin, a pin number. That's gonna be our selected pin state and value. This is a uh, I think it was an int integer and we've got the we've got the boolean so I'm going to change that um, basically by doing something like that so if it's if it's true we're going to pass one if it's false we're gonna we're gonna pass zero nice okay so that's how you send the digital write message to the to the WebSocket server, and then that's gonna be passed to ESP32 microcontroller. With that, we can essentially control LED diode. The only issue here, though, is that the ESP32 control panel app doesn't keep the previous state. Imagine the scenario where we select, let's say, GPIO22 pin, we change the state of that pin, the voltage on the pin to high, right? So by toggling this toggle. And then we refresh that page. We go to GPIO 22 again, and we see it as off, which is not true, right? Because we've just changed the voltage to high, right? 
Um, the reason why this is like that is very simple, right? We don't use digital uh, read when we select the pin, which should happen, by the way, right? So whenever we select the pin, that application should read the state of the pin first before allowing user to change the state of that uh, pin. Um, and by the way, there is one more thing I've just noticed that is missing, and that is the pin mode, right? We don't have any guarantee that a particular pin that we control with this app is set to output. The mode of that pin is set to output. But that's very simple to fix. We can just initially, when we render this whole component with the use effect, we can call this function that is just going to iterate over all of the output pins and just send a message that is going to be action msg type is going to be cmd body type pin mode right and pin is gonna be a pin finally the mode is gonna be output so yeah that's gonna make sure all of the output pins will be the actual output pins right otherwise if they're not in output mode that toggle wouldn't work so yeah i've just fixed that nice now when we select a different gpio pin what we want to happen is for the digital read to happen okay so whenever this is changed on change function is executed we want to send a message again that's gonna be json stringify action msg then type cmd body type digital read this time okay that's that's how we're gonna read that information about selected gpio pin and then there's gonna be just a pin which is a uh, which is gonna be this bit that we can create a variable for. Uh, let's call it a new pin. So that's what's gonna be passed to set selected pin, but also to send message body. Okay, so that's gonna handle sending the message to ESP32 through the server, of course. Okay, so we've got the pin mode that's fixed. We've got the digital read. Now we need to handle receiving the message, okay? Because once that message is sent, ESP32 microcontroller is going to send back the output. Let me show you. Digital read. We have the output type of a message and that has to be handled in the React application. To handle that, we're going to look at the last message, right? This is where all the information about the last received message from the WebSocket server is kept. Um, but in order to handle it, right, this, this is going to change over time very often, I, I, would, I would assume. We want to listen to that change. Every single change of last message, whenever a new message is received from the server, we want to be able to capture it from here, from this app. And we can do that with use effect again. Because if you specify a state, which is essentially last message internally, this is just a React state that changes. Whenever that state changes, that function is going to be executed. And in that function, first of all, we want to make sure that last message is not null. And if it is, we want to stop from going further, right? That's just going to stop executing that function, which is return nothing. But if it's not null, 
that means we just received some sort of message. What this message is, is for that function to identify and then act accordingly, right? So let's just do that. Um, how to read that message? Um, we have a certain guarantee that the type of that message is a JSON string, right? It is going to be received as string, but we know this is a JSON. Whatever comes from the server is a JSON. So I can stride away a parse that with JSON parse. So on the last message, we have a data field and that data contains this whole uh, string, this whole message, right? Once the message is parsed, we need to, um, yeah, this is got, it's got a type of any, which I don't really like. So let's uh, define a type for the message. Maybe let's call it message body. This is essentially a message body. And we have an action, if you remember again. We've got a type and we've got the body, which we don't know what kind of type it is at that uh, point until we uh, read what is the uh, what is the type uh, let me show you so here i'm just gonna sort of cast it as message body and i'm gonna use a simple if statement on a past message so i want to make sure maybe let's make let's make sure this action is msg because if it's not MSG, we're going to ignore it. It's something not recognized, okay? So again, a reader. Then, if this is MSG and the type is output, right? If this is an output, output is the type of a message that's received back from digital read, right? When we send the digital read to ESP32, what it sends back is the output type of message. And then we know that the actual body from the past message body has a type number, right? Because it is a number, is zero or one. And having this piece of information, we can simply call set pin value but one thing to make sure about is to also capture it in with use effect so set pin value um i think there is some issue okay yeah the issue is that this should go in there right the top of the of the react component and then set pin value is going to use that body. If that body is uh, zero, we're going to pass it, sorry, yeah, we're going to pass it as false. Otherwise, that's going to be true. Okay, that's how we're going to do it. And that's essentially it, right? So now we don't really need to keep any state anywhere because that state is going to be set thanks to digital uh, read. So whenever the pin is selected, the digital read is sent to the server, then to ESP32 microcontroller. ESP32 microcontroller is going to send back an output message. That output is going to be read in here in this use effect. And if the type is really output, right, we're going to uh, parse the body as a number and we're going to set that value to a pin value state, right? So we will see in there, we will see on if that particular pin that we selected has a high voltage, right? Also, one additional issue that I've just noticed is with this GPIO 18, the default pin. The problem is uh, for that is that the state is not going to update when you open this app, 
right? So when we just visit that page, that's the default GPIO. And because it is a default value at that point, on change hasn't been triggered yet, right? You actually need to change something. So click on the drop down and change it, change it to something else, right? This is when on change function here is executed, right? When you just open it, this doesn't happen. There is a simple fix uh, for that, which is uh, by calling send message digital read when we render this component, okay? But this has to obviously be this this has to be called with the the default pin which is uh, the first one but let's let's maybe split it out so let's create the default output pin var which is going to be output pins 0 and then let's go with default output pin as a default here and also in there okay so now we're going to make sure that at the very beginning when this select box has a default pin digital uh, read has happened and that toggle has been updated with the current state of that pin right okay and this is it in terms of controlling digital pins in a real time from this control panel i think we can give it a test now so let's quickly wire up LED diode with current limiting resistor and let's see if we can control that diode. Here is the circuit diagram. As you can see, that's pretty straightforward. We've got LED diode, which in my case is rated for 1.8 volts of forward voltage and 20 milliamps of current, which gives us 75 ohms, right? At least 75 ohms of a current limiting resistor that I am going to use. All of this wired to digital pin GPIO 18. But yeah, feel free to connect more LED diodes to different digital pins because we'll be able to control all of them from our ESP32 control panel. Okay, let's just wire it up quickly. All connected. Let's just wait a few seconds for the built-in blue diode to switch on. Okay, so the ESP32 is connected to Wi-Fi now. Let's now give it a test. So um, I'm going to refresh this page and I'm going to uh, keep the GPIO 18 as a selected pin and I'm going to switch it on. Okay, we can see that LED diode is switched on. When I switch off, it switches off immediately. So we have a near a real time communication, right? But it really looks like a, a real time because for me, this is like milliseconds of delay. I don't even notice it. Okay, so um, what I can do now is to uh, test other GPIO. So if I uh, select a different GPIO, let's say 22, for example, and I switch it on and then connect my LED to that pin instead, it is instantly switched on. So this is working as well on the other GPIOs. The final test of digital read, let's keep this switched on and let's refresh this whole page. Then let's select GPIO 22 and that is being switched on automatically because of the digital read, right? That was an instant change of this toggle. Okay, so this is all working fine. Of course, this can be used not only to uh, control the voltage, we can do many different things, but that depends on what kind of project we're thinking about uh, building. And now time for the final step, which is going to be to deploy our ESP32 control panel to AWS S3 so we can control the microcontroller from any place in the world with internet connection. In order to do that, I need to run a few commands. First, what we need is the production build of our website, of our control panel. To create the production build, 
what needs to be run is the yarn build command or npm run build. So I'm gonna hit enter now, and that should create a dist directory in my project with the production build, right? We've got index.html and then one CSS file and one JavaScript file. Okay, then I need to create AWS S3 bucket and the command to create that bucket is with the use of AWS CLI S3 API, which is AWS S3 API create bucket where you need to specify bucket flag with the name of that bucket, a region with the region where you want to create your bucket in and create bucket configuration flag. This is again, uh, just location constraint with the same region that's been specified for the region flag. So yeah, I'm gonna hit enter now. Okay, so the bucket is created. Let's upload our production build to this bucket. That is AWS S3 is sync, as for synchronized command. And as you can see, I've got a dist directory with my production build that's gonna get synchronized with S3 SP ESP32 control panel, right? So that's gonna send all of the files from this directory to, to the control panel bucket. Okay, that's done. The first step is to create a bucket policy, okay? So I've just created a TMP bucket policy JSON file, right? Bucket policy JSON file in a TMP folder. I'm gonna open it with Visual Studio Code. And now I'm going to paste a policy that I've prepared beforehand, which is essentially allowing for the public access for everyone on the internet to this bucket, but it's just read-only access. Okay, on that ESP32 control panel bucket. Now to upload this policy, I'm gonna use AWS CLI again. And that is a put bucket policy command, where again, we need to specify the bucket flag and the policy with the path to that file I've just created and modified. So you're gonna hit enter. Then uh, I need to press the Q button because the preview has been opened. Okay. And the final command, which is AWS S3 website. And this is to specify the index document, right? Which is going to be index HTML. Going to press enter. And that's it. Now we should have a website on the internet working that allows us to control ESP32 in a real time, right? From any place in the world. So let's just go to that website, which is ESP32 control and panel, S3 website, then the region and amazonaws.com domain. So gonna hit enter. And as we can see, we've got ESP32 control panel, if I change GPIO to 22, it switches, like toggle switches to, to on automatically because we've switched that uh, pin on, on the, on the local, right? On the local app, um, which stayed there because I've got my microcontroller still on. And this is it for today. However, if you are interested in more content about serverless WebSockets, check out this video where I have built fully functioning web chat application step by step. If you'd like to support me, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell. Thanks for watching and cheers, bye.